Welcome back to another edition of the Night Report Podcast. I'm your co-host, Mike Broadbent. Joining me once again is my co-host, Richie Schneiderite. Richie, uh, the basketball team lost the senior day against uh, Northwestern. It's a game where Rutgers really didn't look competitive in the entire game, to be honest, outside of the first eight minutes. Um, so we'll talk about that. We'll talk about the Big Ten tournament first round game. Uh, I guess it's not it's second round against Michigan. We'll talk some basketball recruiting. Uh, Rivals announced or put out its class of 2024 rankings, so there's a lot going on there. You got to see a, bas- the, a basketball practice in person and ask some questions to the team, so a lot of meat on the bone. Let's start with the game, though. Uh, Rutgers lost against Northwestern, who just, I mean, credit to them. They played their asses off. They, they hit a lot of clutch shots. They were running the, the cliff uh, alley-oop play over and over against us. Gave us a lot of Good taste of our own medicine, and Rutgers just looked totally out of sorts. Just really bad turnovers left and right. Um, honestly, we don't look like a tournament team right now, but our resume says differently. So just talk about the game. What did you see in the, in the Northwestern game that really concerned you? Uh, guard play. Um, Cam Spencer not shooting enough. Um, Paul Mulcahy's struggles continued. Uh, Cliff actually had a pretty good game. Um mm-hmm. Other than that, like there's just Hyatt's still cold as could be. He's missing a ton. There's no bench play. Uh, we kind of knew that already. Um, they just, just there's just a whole bunch of issues with this team, and I, it, I, you can't blame Mag's injury for all of it. And it's just a matter of once they started slumping. And I, I've said this in previous pods. Once you get in a slump, it's so hard to get out of one. Yeah. And we we've seen that with Paul recently. We've seen it with Hyatt and. We're just seeing it with this entire bench too. Like it's it's just a rough look to watch. It's even it's rough to watch this basketball team. They're scoring yeah. like fifty points, like in fifty points or not. They didn't score above fifty eight in four of the past five games. It's just a rough watch. Like they scored forty five versus Michigan, fifty three. They got beat the crap out of by Northwestern, despite a little bit of a comeback at one point, but. For the most part, Northwestern just kind of carried that game away. They lost to Minnesota, who's yeah. probably the worst power, high major power five team, power six, whatever you want to fucking call it, in all of those conferences. Like, yeah. they're bad. All you had to do was win that, and you're in. No question. We're probably talking 10 seed. Now we're talking bubble, and it's yikes. Yeah, I, d- I definitely think we're more on the bubble than – like, there, there seems to be a lag with, uh, you know, bracketology and, like, realistically where you are. I think a lot of uh, bracketologists still have Rutgers in right now. I think you were saying that, like, 80-some out of 100 projected brackets still have Rutgers in the field, mostly as an 11 seed. I don't – 85, yeah. 85 out of one – what? One, 103. So, I mean, that's still pretty good odds, like – it's still good odds, but that still has the Michigan game yet to be played. That's um, true. So that's a huge, huge game. Minis- Michigan's just given us tr- trouble, like pretty consistently over the last few years, from you know being the only team that beat Rutgers at home a few years ago when we went, I think, eighteen and one at home, to just like you know bodying us up. They have a really talented team. They're not well coached. They're not well disciplined. But they're a team that by the end of the year. The last few years has found a way to just kind of turn it on and make a run going into the tournament. And that's kind of what they're doing now. Like they had a, a really hard luck loss the other night where they gave the ball away at midcourt and they didn't even get a chance to, to get a shot off in overtime. Um, but they're a good team. They're really talented. I think they got like nine rivals, top 150 players on their team. Mm-hmm. They're just, they have depth at every position. That's kind of like what Rutgers is hoping to build towards um, where they can just, you know, have a guy come off the bench and give them some heat check minutes or come in, you know, when a a player goes down for three or four games, Rutgers doesn't really have that depth right now. And that's kind of why we're seeing these struggles. Mm -hmm. Uh, But yeah, this is a game that Rutgers kind of has to win. Yeah. No, that Michigan team's really good. They're super talented. And I think if you give any other coach the reins of that team, they're not where they are currently. They're not an eight seed in the big 10 or nine, eight seed, eight seed. Um, I watched the game versus Indiana the other day, and Indiana is probably second uh, highest odds, I would say, to win the Big Ten tournament right now. Yep. Uh, and they're a good team too, but this Michigan team just – they should have – they probably should have beat them because Hunter Dickinson hit the game-tying free throw, and then they missed uh, – I forget what – I think they just missed a stupid basket. Um, and they gave up a basket on the other end, and then Indiana goes on to win in overtime. But 
Uh, they're, they're super talented. I think it's going to be insanely tough. Rutgers record all time versus Michigan right now. I'm looking one and 15. Jesus. Like, it's just, it's not a good matchup for Rutgers whatsoever. The only time they beat them was actually last year in January, 2022. And that was at Michigan. I th- no, no, I'm sorry. That was a home game. Um, 75, 67. They beat them. Other than that, they most recently lost by 13 and they lost by nine. Then they lost by 12, 15, eight, like, for most part, Michigan, like you said, has dominated the series, and they're just so talented. I don't see a way that Rutgers pulls this one out, to be honest. I hate to say it, but this is a team you just scored 45 against on your home court. Yeah. You don't have home court anymore. If anything, you could argue they might have home court because it's in Chicago. It's closer to them. Yeah. And, I mean, this is why we were a little pessimistic, even at coming off of wins like against, you know, at Wisconsin, like – a lot of people got on us for being negative. Like there was a clear, and it's tough to take your your scarlet colored gla- glasses off sometimes when you're watching your team. But it was a clear difference in how well this team was playing after the Michigan State game in games like Indiana and Illinois. And it was it was kind of like a you know canary in a coal mine as to what was coming. Like it's easy to forget that that Illinois game we were winning for like the majority of that game. I think we were winning like. For 25 of the first like 27 minutes of that game, we had that yeah. you know stretch where they they outscored us 19-0 at one point. That was a game that like Rutgers was winning, and like you could just tell that the team had a really tough time adjusting to the physical and mental exhaustion that came with just like only having six or seven guys who could play, um, and that's kind of compounded over you know the span of eight games because Rutgers is now uh, two and six in its last eight games uh, since uh, what mag went down. It's just like when you, when you're struck, cause a lot of these guys are banged up too. Like Paul is definitely not right. I saw some rumors that, you know, he might be dealing with either a torn labrum or a separated shoulder that might be causing like a nerve issue. Like mm. I, I know it's not really the most credited source, but somebody on the, the Rutgers Reddit um, was saying that Paul has like limited sensation in his in his shooting hand and shooting arm. So that would kind of explain his offensive woes. But like a lot of these guys are banged up too. Like Caleb's, you know, he got that hard foul against Minnesota where he landed really hard on his back. He's obviously missed a game because of his back problems. He has knee problems. Like this dude is just a warrior going out there and playing probably not at a hundred percent. A lot of those guys probably have injuries that we're not hearing about too. And that's kind of that that fatigue that builds over the year when you only can play a you know a handful of dudes. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, no, they, they, Caleb especially between I think uh, Pike said it to us the other day in our little um, ask around on senior day. We we didn't ask too much. We asked about uh, Caleb and his uh, his grind from year one to year five now, and he said this man's had foot surgery, he's had back surgery, he's had shoulder surgery, he's done this, and I'm just like Jesus Christ, man! Yeah. I, you just name like five injuries, five surgeries, not even injuries. We're talking five surgeries, and I'm like, this is a college player too. It's not like he's a professional. Yeah. So it's, I think it was more like four actually, but still, I mean, nonetheless, it's still significant. Um, and obviously he didn't practice the day before the game the other day. Like the man it's hit or miss back issues are the worst. And I, I can't speak from experience or anything like that, but one day you're great. And the next day you can't even move. So it's, it's just a crap shoot. And ideally he's probably going to be fine for Michigan. I would assume, but he still might be in pain when he's playing. Yep. And then, like you said, Paul, if, is that, if that rumor is true, Paul's clearly in pain too. Yeah, I mean, he's had multiple shoulder problems this year. Uh, I forget if it was against was it against Nebraska where it seemed like he re, re-injured that. Yeah, I believe it was on a layup attempt, I think, and he fell. Nah, I, think he got, like, I think he got, like, past the ball at the top of the arc and, like, somebody, like, made contact with him on Nebraska and, like, he was just holding it and he was dribbling at the same time mm-hmm. and – I don't know exactly the game, but he definitely re-injured it in the last eight games. Yeah, I'm going to have to look um, back and check that out. But yeah, some some numbers since Mag went out, um, courtesy of Are You From NJ. So Rutgers in terms of, uh, there's 363 teams in Division One. So points per game, Rutgers is averaging 60.1. That is tied for 349th in Division One basketball. The field goal percentage is 40.7%. That's 331st in Division One basketball. Our three-point percentage is 319th at 31.3%. And our free throw percentage is 585 And that's dead last in Division One basketball. 
Yeah, that's not good. <laughs> um, no. And those obviously uh, are just offensive numbers. Uh, defensive yeah. numbers are still pretty good, but I mean, that's ultimately like it, you can only have so much enthusiasm and effort on defense if your offense just continues to let you down. Like, there's only just so much gas and enthusiasm in the tank. Like, you know, the rack has wanted to explode for a lot of these games, but there's just been so few opportunities for them to for the crowd to get into games. Yeah, it it drives me nuts too because like it'd be one thing if you're missing all these shots on like fast breaks or stuff like that, and you're just pushing the tempo. But you're I'm looking right now for ten palm tempo is two forty one, still yeah. bottom tier. Like you're not like rushing anything. You're you're playing slow as fuck actually. Like yeah, and you're still missing these shots. You're missing lay ins. You're missing two footers. Whether yep. it be I remember Hyatt missed a two footer. I mean Cliff misses the, th- every two three footer now unless it's a dunk. It's like geez like. And then on top of that, I, I know this is a stupid factor, but they do a, uh, actually look at luck, and Rutgers is three forty six in luck. Yeah, like, yep. that's like bottom twenty, I believe. Like, it's not good. Um, yeah, I, I wonder how many teams have lost multiple games this year on buzzer beaters. I can't imagine there's many, if any. Rutgers now has two losses at the buzzer to Ohio State and to uh, Minnesota. Um, Actually, Ohio State, ironically, is the worst and most unlucky team, according to Ken Palm. I'd argue Rutgers should be more just because of that Ohio State game. Yep, yep. Oh, geez. But, uh, yeah, it's it's a rough look right now. I don't know. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, I've kind of speculated um, with you and to other people that, like, I know Pike really, it, like, really likes consistency and really aspires to have as little turnover as possible. But mm-hmm. I feel like after this season, you really kind of have to take a, look, a long, hard look in the mirror and probably change that tune a bit. Like, I do think that we really need some kind of offensive specialist assistant coach, like somebody who can come in and almost be Pike's offensive coordinator. So I know he has like certain coaches take certain assignments. Like I think Brandon Knight is usually responsible for like, substitutions rotations, um, that, rotations yeah. and stuff like that like jay young was the big man's coach before he left i don't know everyone's role specifically but mm-hmm. somebody has to come in and kind of like modernize this offense because like obviously like if you have elevated talent you'll be able to to do more like if more guys can get shots for themselves it makes running an offense a lot easier but somebody's just got to come in and just kind of overhaul this offense because it's not like we're not really running sets most of the time. It's like the <laughs> exception. It's the exception, not the rule that we're actually going in and running an offensive set or offensive plays. Like a lot of guys just kind of stand around and like we try and get the ball into to, to Cliff, but we're not putting Cliff in like great situations. Like we're giving him the ball in awkward positions. Like we're giving him the ball in like the baseline a lot where he's, you know, 10 feet away mm-hmm. and he doesn't really have anywhere to go and he's getting doubled and he's just not comfortable there. So Getting our players in positions where they're, you know, put in positions to succeed is one thing. But, I mean, we just have to run. Danny Breslauer talks about this over and over, just like repeatable offense. We don't really do that often. So, Well, they did that one, uh, what was it, chess play? And that chess worked middle, yeah. phenomenal. And then all of a sudden well, it's like, you know, it's gone. There it goes. Like, Well, they just, they, they, it's like when you discover a new food you like, and then you just eat it over and over and over until you get sick of it. That's kind of like what's happening is like we find a play that works and we run it over and over until defenses figure out how to stop it. And, you know, we go back to the same stuff. Um, yeah. but I also think we're going to see, you know, last year we didn't have a single player transfer out. I don't see that being the way that things go this offseason. Um, I'd be shocked. It seems like, uh, according to some insiders on the boards, um, Rutgers is already starting to, to – to talk to some, or to reach out to some transfer portal guys who have entered the portal. Um, and there's not many guys in the portal right now. So if we're already reaching out to the few that have entered since the end of the season, I think Rutgers will be very active in the transfer portal, which is good because we need usable depth. And I think we had, I think sometimes you, you have, you show more effort in guys than effort is, or sorry, you, there's more interest shown in guys than, uh, and are showing interest in you. I think the opposite was true last offseason. I think there was a lot of players who were interested in Rutgers, but Rutgers didn't really show interest in them. I think yeah. there will still be a lot of interest from players in Rutgers, but I just think Rutgers will be looking for more this offseason than they did this past offseason. 
Yeah, no, you definitely need help. You need a scoring option. You you might need a center at this point. We don't know what Clef's going to do. I know people are like, yeah, he's not good enough for NBA. No shit. Like, no, I know yeah. he's not good enough for NBA. But, like, he, he still could go to the G League very easily. He can go to the G League and be working 24-7 with basketball coaches. The G League produces. I don't care what anyone says. Go read it for yourself. There's physical proof and evidence to it. They have NBA championship coaches that started in the G League. They have several big name college coaches that started in the G League. Like it, it's a proven commodity now. It is no longer the D League where it was like, yeah, you know what? You're gonna go get paid 80k. Have fun. Maybe you'll make it one day. Now it's like a full blown minor league system, and it's totally legit. And now it's very competitive with several like European and uh, Asian leagues too. Like this isn't just like some knockoff league anymore. It's legit. Yeah. Like. And people got to realize that. And someone asked, asked me the other day, they're like, hey, like, why would he do the G League? Like, Ron's not making anything in the G League. I'm motherfucker, Ron's making like 800K right now, and he's set to make 1.2 next year as a qualifying offer. And with the way he's playing, he's probably going to get more than that qualifying offer. Yeah. So there's your proof right then and there. Yeah. And at the same time, like, this is, there's going to be a special on Cliff that comes out this week uh, from Ooh, CBS. Wednesday, tomorrow. Yeah, CBS on the CBS Evening News. Cliff can't make money in, uh, on a student visa via NIL the way that a lot of other kids can. So, you know, while you can point to, you know, it making sense financially for a lot of kids to stay in school because of NIL, Cliff's not one of them. So Cliff has to donate all of his money he makes from NIL to charity. And then he does that. And, you know, it's, it's a really awesome thing he's doing. I don't want to spoil the story, but... Stay tuned to, to CBS Evening News tomorrow night because they're going to do a, a special on him, like I said. But if he can't make money especially, like that's even more incentive for him to go to the G League. That song lyric is just in my head. It's like, you can make money especially. <laughs> <laughs> is that, right? Is oh that the lyric? God. Am I wrong? I feel like that's the lyric. I, I don't might know. be wrong. Maybe it's just me mumbling in what I'm singing. But um, yeah, no, uh, Cliff donates all his money, which is number one. Great on him. Yeah. Um, cause he, he has a couple deals. He's got what chips Ahoy. He's got, uh, the 21 flavors or 12 flavors, whatever the hell that ice cream parlor is. Yeah. I don't even think it's ice cream. I think it's Froyo, but, yeah. um, and then there's, I think he has something else. I can't remember what it is, but he, he literally cannot make a single dime. So it's not like Kayla where it's like, Hey, you know what? You want to come back? We, we can make it work. Like we can throw you some, throw your bone here or there. Now it's like, Hey Cliff, um, you want to go make money or you want to just, you know, college one more year? Maybe you're already graduate or you graduate in May. Like, yeah, bring me out just for fun. Maybe just one more year of classes and being a student. Like, think about it. Like, it's just honest. Like end yep. of the day, like it, it makes a lot of sense for him to leave, to be honest. Like, yeah. And neither of us want him to leave. And both of us understand how important he is to this team, but ultimately he's got to, do what's best for him if, if that's to leave and you know start a pro career that's what he's got to do so i think that'll be the most interesting thing to follow uh, because that'll put a huge onus on pike to find a big man transfer um mm -hmm. we could have had the kid from lehigh last year if there was a starting role to give to him what was his name I don't even uh he ended up at richmond um Lafayette, right wasn't he from it's either Lehigh or Lafayette, one of those two. I always get those two schools. I want to say it was Lafayette just because uh, everyone, like, that's just the school that school that never stops giving. Well, he did the, he did play against Rutgers last year, so I remember that specifically. So it would have to be Lafayette, I would think. But I'm looking mm -hmm. now. Oh, Neil Quinn. There yeah, is. Neil Quinn. Yeah, yeah. Um, he's... Yeah, and, and, I mean, he had a pretty good season this year. He it was Evan Mize number one ranked player on Richmond this past season in terms of his BPR metric. Um, 9.4 and 4.4, 2.8, 53%. Like, it's solid yeah. numbers. It's yeah, decent. I mean, you expect his numbers to drop off going from Lafayette to Richmond because, you know, it's a pretty significant upgrade in, in talent going from, uh, I think it's the Patriot League to the A-10. Mm -hmm. um, so. Although uh, it does not look like they're going to make a run this year. Looks like they are they out already. They might be. Yeah, they are. Yep. So, all right. Oh well. So anyway, there's like good players who are showing interest in Rutgers. It's just one: are they okay with the amount of playing time? Which oftentimes they either want a guaranteed amount of playing time or guaranteed money. So Pike doesn't like playing those games, but I think he's going to have to be a little more flexible 
or he's just going to have to cast a wider net in looking for transfers this upcoming offseason. Yeah, no. I mean, uh, Pike says it every year. He said it at the media day, uh, the local media day press conference. The first question like people ask him is, how much am I playing? How much am I getting? Or I'm sorry, yeah. it used to be. This is actually, this is the wording. It was, it used to be, how much am I playing? Now it's, how much am I getting? And it's like, dude, what the fuck? Like, no, it's not how it works. Like, I mean, yeah, it is kind of how it works, but it's not how it's supposed to work. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. They're, this team could look vastly different next year because not only are you bringing in three different guys that are probably two of the three are guaranteed contributors next year, the third yep. may, maybe probably lower down the line, which is fine. And you're probably going to lose a couple portal guys. And I expect a totally different Derek Simpson one next year. I expect a totally yeah. different Antoine Wolfolk next year. Like those those two guys alone are going to look completely different. And then you have Paul in year six if you return year five, year six. I don't know, whatever it is. COVID year. Um, if he returns, which I think he is. Sounds like he is. And then uh, the other two would be Oscar and Andre, who maybe they leave. Maybe Andre wants to go be a starter somewhere because I don't think that role is guaranteed for him next year, especially because he's playing poorly, number one. And number two, Mag, Mag had that, that role easily, like without yeah. question. I mean, Mag was a starter. Andre yeah. Hyatt has never really been a consistent starter outside of filling in for people getting injured. He was a great yeah. six man. Don't get me wrong, but no, I mean, had that starting role. I'd argue, uh, and Pike said it the other day, and I kind of looked into it in terms of six man, like in the Big Ten, he's probably like three or four. Like yeah. he's, he's right there. Um, there's not a lot of them, surprisingly. It's mostly starters that are dominating. But uh, yep, yeah, it's it's going to be interesting. Yeah, and, and one of the guys who got a lot of hype this. Last offseason in, in the summer, some people call him the second best player on the team, Antonio Chole. Um, he's probably going to make a contribution next year. He is a guy who, despite what some outlets are saying, he is not dealing with an injury. Uh, but that's all we'll say about that. He's, he's healthy. Fully suited up every single game. Don't tell me he's injured when he has shorts and a jersey on. Yep. Like, so, it's, and we know for a fact it's not an injury. But whatever. Yeah. Besides the point, not us. Not my problem. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, so we gotta got talk Brightman, right? Yeah, we gotta talk uh, some bracketology, which is tangentially what you're talking about. Um, yeah. So Rutgers, like you said, looks like most bracketologists are projecting them to be in the field. Uh, obviously, one of the elephants in the room is Rutgers should have another quad one win against Ohio State. There's very few games where the conference spoke out and said we messed up, and it basically caused a uh, decision to be kind of reversed as to what it should have been. Like uh, Rutgers, Ohio State was one. Duke, Virginia was the other, I believe. So Aaron Brightman has talked to a source inside of Rutgers Athletics that said that the tournament committee will take that into consideration. Now, like, I think we should kind of expound upon what that actually means. They're not it's getting not, a win. They're not getting a win, yeah. Shut it down. <laughs> it's not going to change our net. I think because Rutgers is now firmly on the bubble, I think it can be used as a tiebreaker. So whether that be, you know, two 11 seeds, one of them has to play in Dayton, and that is how it's decided, or Rutgers is one of the last four in, and that is the tiebreaker to use to kind of put Rutgers in the field over another team. That's kind of how I view it. Is that kind of where you're viewing it as well? Yeah, that's exactly what it sounds like. So, uh like fuck you, Wisconsin, you're out, buddy. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> no, but uh, yeah, that's that's really what it sounds like. It's more of it's not a win. It's not anything. It's not like oh yeah, we got the win now, guaranteed. Like yeah. number one, like it, it. No, like the game's over. The game's a loss. But yeah. if they're gonna go look at resumes and they're extremely close, they're gonna be like, all right, well, Rutgers probably should have had that quad one road win. And we know more than like we we heard it, uh, Wachtell say it on Brightman's podcast. The road. Quad one road wins are more important than almost any other win. Yep. Um, so, I mean, that it's not going to be counted as a win, but as a tiebreaker, I think that's the tiebreaker right there, pending one of those other schools having a last-minute fuck up by the refs. <laughs> but I don't see Mississippi State or Utah State or Wisconsin, Oklahoma State, Michigan, like having one of those. Mm -hmm. um, I, think, I think it definitely helps. And I think a lot of people are misconstruing it too, because there's there's like four hundred something views, four hundred thousand views on his tweet. Mm -hmm. Yep. Because there's Kentucky fans being like, "What? Well, what about our win?" And then it's like Duke fans, "Well, what about this game?" I'm like, dude, stop! That's not what he said. Yeah. Number yeah. one, keep it on topic. It's about Rutgers. 
Number two, yep. it's not a win. Learn how to read. Like that's reading comprehension in today's day and age is just not there for people. It drives me <laughs> ballistic. Like yeah, it's yeah. just like, where did you go to school? Like, what did you do? Yep. Like, God, sorry, I had to vent a little bit. No, it's it's all good. Um, I think one thing we haven't talked about is the awards have been announced today for the Big Ten as well for the, yes. the season long awards. Uh, Caleb McConnell has won the Big Ten Defensive Player of the Year two years in a row. They gave him the Co-Defensive Player of the Year this year because the Big Ten can't seem to just pick one guy for a lot of these awards. Um, just in general, they're terrible with giving awards. Like this past season, freaking Adam Forsack wasn't even the first team Big Ten punter, and he won the Ray Guy Award. So that should kind of tell you how trash the Big Ten is with giving out awards in general. But I think the the – the coach of the year was a co-coach of the year with between Matt Painter and Chris Collins. Like there was like six players on the first team Big Ten uh, awards. As well. Like it's just just it's name cool. five, name one. Yeah, this is like, insane. This isn't like participation trophy time. Like everyone gets one. Like no, pick a person, pick a player, yeah. pick a coach. These are gr- the coaches. One pisses me off more than anything. These are yep. fucking grown ass men making millions and millions of dollars. You think they give a fuck? If maybe actually they probably do because it's probably a little stipulation in their contracts. Now you get coach yeah. of the year. Here's five hundred k. Like no, yep. but end of the day, give them the fuck. Like well, you're just gonna give everyone the coach of the year now. Like you know, like Kevin Willard had a pretty good year. Maryland's projected to suck, but they had finished sixth. Let's just give them coach of the year too. Mind you, that was my pick. I'll, I'll be honest there. I kind of fucked up. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it just it's like drives me insane. It's like what are we what are we doing here? Like yep. Um, Cliff did get second team though, which was uh, by media, not by coaches. By coaches, I think he got third team, and that's that's where I had him too. Yep. And um, there's people attacking me on on Twitter already, saying like, "How did you have Caleb, defensive player of the year, and not have him in your th- top three teams?" And I'm like, to be fair, like he's a great defender. Offense yep. isn't there. Like there's other there's other players that can do both better. Not yep. not defense overall, but like you you get what I'm saying. Yep. Um. But yeah, I had Cliff second or third team. I think that's pretty fair. I don't think he was better than Hunter, and he definitely wasn't better than Edie because without Edie, that Purdue team's ass. Like they are just bad. Yep. Yep. Um, and if you're listening to this podcast, you're probably drunk right now. If you're playing the uh, how many times can Richie Curse game? Um, <laughs> yeah. so I'll, I'll keep it going for you. But uh, yeah, no, I think um, I think everything was kind of spot on. Maybe not six players here and two coaches there and two defensive player of the years, but everything seemed like status quo. And I think that's why it's not really being talked about too much because everyone kind of knew already who's what and where they are. Yep. Definitely. So, um, the last thing I wanted to bring up was that, uh, rivals just came out with this new class of 2024 rankings. Yes. Some very, uh, big Rutgers implications on some of these ranks. So let's just start at the top. Um, Probably our number one target that is uncommitted, Dylan Harper, comes in at number three overall. Ace Bailey, we had alluded to this, but he jumps from number five to number four overall. One of the top targets Rutgers has uh, left that's uncommitted as well. Tyler Betsy from St. Thomas More in Connecticut comes in at number 14 overall. He's also a five-star, a newly minted five-star. Um you have the other ranks available to you between Delquan Warren and Somerville. Yes. Um, do, well, Delquan Warren, first off, is or that, that's before we even get there, actually. Um, Jared Mustaf, somewhere between 35 to 40. I don't have that one official yet. And Rutgers is showing interest in him. They're going to try to get him on campus as well. Yep. Kurt Tang, a slight drop. He goes from 41 to 51, or 43 to 51. Not bad. Still good. I think it's just more of when I was talking to the analysts, it just seems like it's more of the fact that they want him to, uh, the other guys jumped him instead of him falling. Still a very good player. Still a very good combo guard. Still supposed to decide sometime soon, but he's like the most quiet kid in the world. So every mm-hmm. time I talk to him, it's like one or two words. And it's like, yep. yo, when, when you come in soon. Okay. <laughs> um, that sounds about right. Um, so, but it still sounds like it's Rutgers and Michigan state and Providence. Those are his top three by far. Um, we said it before. His AAU coach is very uh, is very close to the Providence staff, so you got to watch out for them there. But uh, moving on, Delquan Warren commit number ninety one to now seventy three overall. He's pushing like I know he's not five star status, but he just keeps getting better and better every time like people watch him. From what I was told, mm-hmm. I don't, I've only seen clips online, but they're like in love with his potential. 
and Lathan Somerville, same thing. This man was unranked. I had to request a ranking for him. They watched his tape, and then they went and saw him, and it's like, there. I, I forget the text. I think it was like, yeah, uh, remember how I told you Nadangu had a ton of potential and uh, like his ceiling's really high? And, and I just found it. I was like, yeah, da, da, da. And he's like, Lathan Somerville, more potential. Like, that kid's wow. fucking good. And I was like, okay, that's cool. <laughs> this this message board's going to love me. All of a sudden, yeah. you have, like, Rutgers in, what, the conversation with seven of the top fifth, top 90 kids? Like, yep. insane. Um, Who am I missing? I feel like that's missing something. Oh, and mind you, one of the analysts that's in charge of uh, in, the inputs their rankings told me, Word for word, I have Ace Bailey as my number one. Number one. <laughs> I mean, I I can't. Uh, that's who. I mean, I'm not a ranker. I'm not part of the rivals, you know, team to decide this. But I think if you're looking for like what the N- NBA is looking for, like Ace Bailey has it. He's an elite defender and he's an elite offensive player and he's got length. He can hit from deep. He can finish. Can like guard? this dude has it all. He can guard. Like, you know. I would say one through five, but he can guard probably close. three through five in the NBA. Damn. Like he's a, he's he's a dude. I, th- and I think the whole, go on. Sorry. No, no, that's it. The, the only thing I think holding him back is that fact that he had injury all off season, and yeah, that, yeah. that that's a big thing. Where like whether or not people agree with me or not, I do think that a U circuit plays a big role in terms of rankings. Like it's just an easier way to see you against top competition, like the best yep. of the best. And when he misses most of that with an injury. It, it's tough, but he did shake off a lot of rust. Like, it's not like he didn't move up. Like, he still moved up one spot in the rankings, which yep. when you're top five or top 10 or even top 20, it's still significant to move up a spot in any of the rankings. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah. So, I mean, and like Dylan, Dylan went from 10 to three. Like, that's, that's, that's huge. a huge movement. That's as big, honestly, moving from 10 to three is as big as moving from like 150 to 70 or 150 to like 60. Like, that yeah. is a seismic move. And I'll be honest, like people like to question our our guys sometimes, but I think they're spot on with most of these. I think it's very close to accurate, if not accurate. I might have put Bailey like probably two, but I'm biased. Um, but then you see other sites, and it's like Bronny James number eight. It's like, dude, what? Yeah, that Jonathan Gavo- Gavoni um, report that NBA teams are talking about him as a top ten pick is total bullshit. Like, like stop. Like, I, I think, get it because you get LeBron, but, like, stop. <laughs> but also in media, there's so many, like, there's so much horse trading in terms of, like, I'll trade you this information for, like, this puff mm-hmm. piece. That is clearly a puff piece by organize, organized by the Jameses because, like, I – if anybody listens to Bill Simmons, <laughs> Bill Simmons discussed this on his most recent pod or one of his most recent pods, and he talked about it, and he's like, is anyone else hearing this NBA circles? Because I'm not. Like, I've not talked to a single NBA person who has Bronny James even as a first round pick, let alone a top ten guy. So yeah, just for comparison in terms of rankings, insane. that it's just I trust these guys more than anything. They they seem to be spot on right now. Um, and we didn't, you know, what we didn't even talk about we didn't even talk about Nas Cunningham, who's also a yeah. He took a bit of a dip. I think he went from six to seventeen. Four to seventeen, actually. Four to seventeen. Okay. Yeah, not not a good look, but um, it's it's overtime elite. Like it's hard to gauge who you're playing against because it's they're mm-hmm. it's trash. Like I, yep. th- get out of there. Like, do me do me a favor, yep. Nas. Don't go there anymore. Well, no it sounds gonna... like you will be soon, right? Exactly. Sounds like Don Bosco Prep might be having two superstars. So we'll see. All right, so let's talk about where Rutgers stands with a lot of these guys. Uh, we'll start with Dylan. I don't think much has changed there, right? Same old, same old. He's going to take a couple visits. Uh, his top five, I think it was Auburn and Kansas. He hasn't visited yet. And mm-hmm. um, he's probably going to take officials there. And he also still has another fifth official to that fifth school that I, I keep forgetting the name. Oh, Rutgers. Yes. Um, yeah. So it sounds like it's still Duke and Rutgers. It's, it's neck and neck every day. Um, every day I get a question about it on the boards or Twitter. It's like, yo, you hear anything new on Dylan? No. And it's been 10 minutes since that last post. Nope, nothing. Yep. <laughs> so... Yeah, so uh, obviously, if there is any news, you know, you'll you guys will be the first to hear it on the yeah. boards or on Twitter or, or on the pod. Richie's oh, we'll not going to hold that info back. Yeah, we'll be going live like immediately. Yep. 
Ace Bailey is obviously committed. He's moved up. There's not really much more to talk about there. He's a very solid commitment. I don't think we have to worry about anything there. Um, yeah. Let's go on to next in the order. Uh, Tyler Betsy. If anybody watched the interview that he gave with Rob Cassidy, he gave some really glowing words about Rutgers. It's the only program that he discussed having a relationship with his mom. Like that was something he pointed to. Like his mom loves the, the coaching staff. Mm -hmm. She likes that they do all this charity work. She does a lot of charity work and he really trusts his mom. So if his mom likes somebody, you know, he's going to give them even more of a look than he normally would. Um, he also talked about how him and Dylan obviously are, are AAU teammates and have they talked about playing together. And he, ha he said mm -hmm. that they have, but they're mainly focused on their own recruitment. What are you hearing about Tyler Betsy and Rutgers? Um, yeah, so Rutgers is making a significant push for Betsy still. Um, they're they're not giving up. He's uh, played on the same AAU team as uh, Dylan, I believe, for the New York Rams. Yep. Um, UConn is a school that's pushing a little bit. I think they hosted him early season. I forget when, November, yep. September, said, something like that. I think like he said that. that in that interview he's been there multiple times this year for games. Yeah, so he's been there a couple times already. Um, he's, they're very high on him. Obviously, he's down the street, so it's very easy for him at St. Thomas More. Yep. Um, he was at Rutgers in November, I think it was, um, late November. Yes. So yeah, yep. it's, it's not too long ago. Um, so, I mean, Rutgers is making up significant ground here. It, it sounded like it was Duke all the way. It sounded like we've heard Memphis. Um, and now it sounds like you, UConn and Rutgers and Rutgers more than UConn right now is pushing heavily. And it's, and you, you saw the interview, you watched it. Like it's. Sounds like Rutgers is making some inward in ground or ground in ground. I, I don't know what the fuck we're looking for. Inroads. There we go. I can't talk today. Um, they're making some inroads there, and if you can get him, holy shit! Like yeah. I say this every time they talk about a prospect now, but Betsy Bailey Dylan, three of the top fourteen going to Rutgers. Add in number seventy three for shits and giggles, and you know what? Let's just throw Kurtang next to him too, number fifty one, and. Yep. Oh, fuck. Well, we're missing a big man. Lathan Somerville. Oh, weird. <laughs> <laughs> Five of the top 90 kids with three of them being in the top 14. Like, yeah, that's that's some shit. champagne problems right there. Um, that's like you just start building the fucking statue for Pike if he pulls it off. Get the trophy case shined and ready because, you know, he has an empty shelf. Like he's waiting for it. He might as well mm -hmm. just start dusting it because it's it's going to be need to be cleaned. Absolutely. Uh, let's move now down to Nas Cunningham, who named Rutgers in his top five recently. He's obviously moved down in the rankings a bit, but I don't think that really takes away from any of his potential. Um, I know that he took a, an official visit to Memphis recently, and you alluded to, you know, a lot of the conversation in his visit to Memphis was regarding NIL. Um, are you still hearing Memphis is the team to beat there, and where does Rutgers stand? Yeah, Memphis is still... Uh... Numero uno, it sounds like. Um, Rutgers is a little bit behind them. I, I don't – it's we, it's a weird situation because I don't see Rutgers pushing too hard, and I don't think he's – a as, as weird as it sounds, I don't think he's a good fit for the culture either. Yeah. Um, he seems like more of a me guy, which I, I'm not hating on the kid. Like, hey, you're good. Like, be cocky. Like, do whatever yeah. you want. But it is it is tough. I don't think um, Rutgers is going to be able to land him. But Rutgers is up there, so that's the intriguing part. And especially if he's best friends with – not best friends. If he's very close with Dylan – I, I think if you if he wants to come and Dylan's like, yo, we need him. Like, I don't think you question it. I think you say, all right, yeah. whatever, top 15 player again. Like, here we go again. Like, Yes. If he wants to come, you can't turn him down. But it's mm -hmm. it might not be worth putting all your eggs in that basket at the same time. Yeah, it's, it's a tough, tough call there. Um, so moving down the list a bit, Kurt Tang. Or, or yeah, what's his name? Uh, Mustaf is right oh, around Mustaf. Jared yeah. Gustav and Kurt Tang are similarly ranked. So let's talk about both of them. Kurt Tang obviously recently took a visit to Rutgers. He hasn't decided yet. That's still kind of he could decide at any moment. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, he's uh, he's very <clears throat> quiet. Um, he doesn't talk to a lot of reporters or anyone in general. I know I've gotten like little tidbits out of him. I've talked with his staff or just coaching staff down there or up there, geez. His coaches. Um, and it's, it's the same thing. It sounds like it's Michigan State, Providence, Rutgers in no specific order. Um, it did sound like Rutgers was gaining some ground when they did recently uh, host him on an official visit. Now, it seems like it's starting to even out a little bit more. I still have Rutgers in a tiny bit of a lead, but I'm not as confident as I once was before. So it's going to be something to watch. Um, he's not a backup option. They'd take him like in a heartbeat. He's still a very good player. Um, 
Whereas I think Mustaf is more of a backup option to Betsy. Now you're still keeping them like warm. You still chat them up. You still do all the, the basic recruiting things. Mm-hmm. But I think Betsy's target number one in terms of getting a wing. And then Mustaf would probably be number two backup plan, which is top 40 backup plan. Cool. Yeah. Can't beat that. Um, let's talk about the last two guys on this list who are showing Rucker serious interest or already committed. Uh, Delquan Warren, obviously committed. Then there was some talk that he's kind of like keeping his mm-hmm. uh, recruitment open. Are you hearing that he's a pretty solid commit and that was just kind of like a kid who might not necessarily know what he means when he says that kind of stuff? Or I think that's part of it. And I think when, when you interview these guys, you, you got to be careful with how you word questions because – yeah. If I'm going to go, a like, kid just commit it. I'm not, my first question is not going to be like, hey, man, do you have a plan on making any more visits? Like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm thinking about it. And that's like a first reaction. Like, it's just like, yeah, like I'm still thinking about making visits. Like, it's not like he's going to make those visits, but it sounds like he's pretty solidly committed. Hell of a job by TJ Thompson there. He, he locked this one up pretty quickly. Um, and he just keeps moving up. Like, the kid's just crazy athletic. Like, and he's, he's going to be a great point guard. He's a traditional old school point guard. Um, Great, uh, great vision, great ball handling. Like he, he fits next to a certain Dylan Harper that would be perfect complements to each other. And it's like, nice. even with Ace, if it's just him and Ace, it's still a pretty good tandem. So, I mean, this, this team could have significant weapons. And I, I, I know I'm probably putting the cart before the horse, but like dust the shelf off, dust it off, <laughs> get it ready. It's, it's uh-huh. coming. So. Um, and then the last one is Lathan Somerville. I think he took an official visit to Rutgers um, in the last month. I believe it was official. Was it unofficial? I don't. I don't even remember anymore. I, I'm lost at this point. Um, it wasn't official. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so. Yeah. Go is on. he looking to decide anytime soon, or or what? Are you, what are you hearing regarding Rutgers and, and Lathan Somerville? Sounds like he wants to take like one to two more visits before deciding, but Rutgers uh, did a pretty good job of showing him to campus, giving him a good time. And uh, he, he got to meet the team. He got to get the environment of the, of the school and see like the atmosphere and did everything that basically most officials do. But he also wants to visit Villanova, which is one I'm going to keep a close, close eye on because it's, I know Villanova, they suck this year, blah, blah, blah. Watch them go win the Big Ten or Big East tournament. It'd be wild. It's not crazy. A lot of people are thinking it. I mean, Villanova as a program, it's kind of shocking how quickly they fall off. And they weren't, they were a blue blood because of their recent success, but they're not a blue blood mm-hmm. the same way like Kentucky or Kansas or Duke was. They're like kind of like new money. Um, yeah. But I could see Duke having a similar fall off if they don't get the coaching situation settled. Like if Shire doesn't elevate his game because like Villanova is struggling this year in the first year without Jay Wright. And. <sighs> I don't yeah. see that changing because the recruiting's not going well either. Like they got well, the kid Whitmore this year, and he's probably going to be a lottery pick. Mm-hmm. So they don't really have anyone great committed in the twenty three class. Well, that's the crazy thing is people like I, I've seen multiple analysts say it, and like I, I've seen uh, even Brad Wachtel, everyone's favorite bracketologist, say it. Like it's not crazy for Villanova to win that Big East tournament. Like they're they're going to make a yeah. push, and they're super athletic. They're finally healthy, and. Let's see what happens. I mean, they're they're not as far off as people think they are. Like they're still pretty much up there. It's just they had a bad year. They got struck by the injury bug, and as as we know, covering Rutgers, we know what the injury bug can do to a team. Like, yep, that's true. So it's it's something to watch. Um, they are a program to watch. Uh, other than that, I think Xavier and Missouri were the other two, if I recall correctly. Um, he like I said, he wants to take more official visits. So it's it's kind of like a not a moot point, but a moot point at this point. So it's just, just kind of wait and see what happens. Maybe Rutgers puts some pressure on and he decides. Maybe Rutgers gets a commitment from one of those five-star guys, and then it's like, all right, hey, either shit or get off the pot. So Yep, yep. Yeah, Rutgers we'll could hold significant leverage soon if they get a few more commitments. Um, sounds like some of them are not really uh, on the, the horizon. Like we know that Dylan Harper's talked about a summer summertime decision for a while. I don't think mm-hmm. he's going to move that up. Um, obviously, anything could happen, but he seems pretty set on when he's deciding. Uh, I don't think Betsy has really thrown out a de- decision date. Um, no. But I think but that's hey. kind of all I wanted to touch on. Uh, is there anything you wanted to, to hit on before we head out of here? Let me just 
go through the boards real quick to make sure I'm not missing anything. No, no, no. Um, no, I mean, Big Ten tournament Thursday, Michigan. It's it's not an easy matchup. We went over it. Um, it's it's going to be extremely tough. Here's the – I guess I saved this for the end of the pod, the bad news. Uh, I have Michigan winning the Big Ten tournament. You'll see it in our picks tomorrow. So. Oh, geez. Yeah. Um, I think they're really talented. I think their coach just sucks, um, which, I mean, am I wrong? No, because I think if you give, like I said before, you give Martelli or anyone else the reins of that team, and I think they go far. But we'll we'll see what happens. I mean, I still think even with that loss, I will say, I still think they're in. Now, with that loss, I think that secures Dayton with 100% fact. Like, you're, yeah, you're not probably. getting anything else. And uh Take what you can get. Just get in the tournament and go from there. Um, I don't know how much noise, if any noise, they're going to make in this tournament. I think it's going to be a rough, a rough go of it, regardless. But uh, just don't get the NIT. Like, I mean, as much as all of us would love to go to Vegas for the NIT semis and finals, but mm-hmm. um, no, it, I just get in that tournament, break that that streak. It's three in a row. Because otherwise, you're going to have to wait another three years, and it's like shit. Like that's it's pain in the ass. And you might not even have some of these guys for three years. It might be that good. True. <laughs> it's also true. I, I, I'd imagine we're not going to see the graduation of some of these players that we're bringing on campus in the next few years. Um, oh, yeah. That wouldn't be sure. a bad thing. That would mean things went very well. <laughs> um, yeah. But I do have some news for you. Oh, I don't God. know if it's good news it's or bad news. It's 4 o'clock. I already know what it is. So is it, the they Giants do? announced their franchising. Saquon. Sa- Saquon Barkley. Oh, and Really? They gave Daniel Jones a four-year, $160 million deal. So that's so, 40, that's 40 a year. That's probably about. Yeah, and it, it's like I hate how, like, squishy NFL contracts could be. That might just be, like, a, in reality, like a two-year, $75 million deal. Yeah, you don't really yeah. know. Like, it's it's a little bit more than what Geno got. It's a little bit more than what Derek Carr just got. Geno's contract? What the? Number one, Wild. I had one good year. Number two, 52 mil in year one, or what was it, or something like that? And I'm like, something like that. Christ, like, I mean, I'm anytime a guy like that can persevere, like, he was like projected to be the number one pick in his, in his uh, NFL draft class. He falls to, you know, 36th overall. He just is like a, a journeyman through his whole career. He's on a Jets team that didn't really set him up to succeed. He never gave up. He finally got an opportunity and he took the mo- he took advantage of it. Uh, so I'm happy yeah. he's getting paid because. I think he's going to make more in year one than he has in his previous like nine years as an NFL player. So I love seeing stories like that, but yeah, tough pill to swallow because you're paying a guy, you know, for performance, he probably can't put up. Uh, yeah, that's the thing, but we've got Saquon back. We've got Daniel Jones back. We're going to run it back and we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, just, it's just, it's kind of putting us in cap hell at this point because now we don't yeah. really know. We don't have money whatsoever. So, um, Maybe you front load it, maybe you back load it. I don't really know, but like I don't get me wrong, great year, nine, six, and one. Um, Daniel Jones put up decent numbers for him. He didn't fumble the ball, he didn't really turn it over that much, and that's a it's a complimentary offense, some would call it. Oh my gosh. <laughs> oh uh, man. I mean, hey, um hopefully uh, Daniel, you got that money, so I, I don't need to see you at Parker House again this summer. I saw you last yeah, time. He right? makes his rounds, right? Like, I've seen a bunch of people. Spray leggings. I'm like, what are you doing, dude? Make <laughs> money. Like, stop. Yeah. Him and uh, uh, Kenny Pickett, Parker House last year. And that's wild. Yeah, it's nutty. I'm probably too old to be going to Parker House at this point, but, you know, hey, it's a summer. It's a, yeah. it's a bar. You can, you can be young in the summer. It's acceptable. All right. Yeah, that's my mantra for the year. <laughs> I'm young in the summer. I'm old in the winter. Yep, that's it. So yeah. with that, uh, bid you farewell. All right, guys. Well, thank you once again for listening. If you haven't already, I don't know why I have to keep telling you, like and subscribe on YouTube. Give us a five-star review on your favorite podcasting app. It really helps us get more viewers and allow Stop us being to do lazy, cooler just things. Do it. Like, yeah, just do it. We have a really, really big podcast that we're filming on Monday. Uh, we're going to have an interview with Pat Hobbs. We did it last year. I thought it was really well done. Uh, We, you know, can't thank them enough for, you know, giving us the hour they did last year. We'll probably do about the same. It's amazing how much can change in one year. We have so much to talk about. Um, A lot of the stuff that we 
artist rendering that we've posted. Yeah, a lot of stuff we talked about last year has kind of came to fruition, and uh, there's a lot more new stuff to discuss. So if you have any questions, Richie will put a thread up on the board. This will be a member-exclusive mm -hmm. thing. Um, we will consider any question you give, but again, we're not going to ask uh, anything ridiculous to the athletic director at Rutgers. So uh, feel free to chime in. We'll try and synthesize a lot of what you're asking and, and get all of what you guys want to hear um, out of Pat Hobbs Mountain. So for Sounds me, Richie, uh, this has been another edition of the Nightport Podcast signing off.